In this video, we're going to talk about what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount about divorce and remarriage. Now, I just want to come to you from a place of mercy and grace. This is a hard topic to talk about because I know a lot of people have been through divorce. I know that there's very few things in our world more painful than going through divorce. I know Jesus offers mercy and grace and forgiveness uh, to people uh, who have gone through divorce. And so th th I, I don't want to in any way come across as legalistic or as hurtful. I don't want anyone to feel guilt out of this. I just want you to hear God's heart on marriage and divorce. On the other side, I have great compassion for people who are in unhappy marriages because uh, there is no uh, greater unhappiness day to day in this life than the unhappiness associated with a bad marriage. And so I get the pain involved in divorce. I also get the pain involved in an unhappy marriage. So this isn't about uh, trying to give you an excuse to get out of your marriage. Uh, this isn't about making you feel guilty about your, your previous divorce. I just want you to hear God's heart. So let's get started. To do this, we're going to have to do three things. We're going to have to understand what the Mosaic Law said about marriage and divorce, what the Pharisees interpreted it, and then what Jesus said to the Pharisees in their interpretation. And once we get that and the whole uh, table is set, I think you'll better understand God's heart behind marriage and divorce. So let's get started. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4 is the primary text in the Old Testament about marriage and divorce. Now, let me set the context for you. In that culture, in those days, divorce was rampant. Now, I know it's hard for us to understand this, uh, but, but in that culture, in that day, women had no rights. They were not they were seen barely above a possession. They, they were more like a servant than they were uh, a, a co-equal in the marriage. No, that's not God's desire. That's not God's dream. That was men, evil, wicked men, and the way they treated women back then. And what they would do is, is a man in those days would marry one or two or three or four or five or six wives. And then for whatever reason, whenever he wanted to, he could divorce his wife. But many men were so mean, spirited about it, that they would actually divorce their wife and not give her a certificate of divorce that would free her from the marriage so she could marry again. They would just do what was called, and this was actually a legal term in those days, they would put her away. And what that means is, is this guy's married to five women and wife number four, he didn't like the way she did something. And so instead of divorcing her so she could go get remarried, he just put her away. He kicked her out, but she didn't have a divorce certificate, which left her in that culture to do one of two things, either become a beggar or become a prostitute. So a man could literally destroy the wife of a woman if he was hateful and revengeful toward a wife that he did not appreciate. He would just put her away. He wouldn't give her a certificate of divorce and destroy her life. So you have to understand that's the context of the Mosaic law behind marriage and divorce because all God is trying to do in the law is protect women. That's what he's trying to do. Women are co-equals with men in the eyes of God. But in that culture, men had dominated over women and, and God is trying to level the playing field. He's trying to protect women. And so in that, here's what he says in that law. Deuteronomy 24, one through four. Listen to this because it's a series of if then, it's, it's a series of if statements followed by a then. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, that phrase indecent is huge in how the Pharisees interpret it. We'll get to that in a minute. He needs to write her a certificate of divorce. So the first thing the Mosaic law addresses is this whole idea of putting away. He says, you can't do that. Absolutely not. God will not let you treat another human being that way. That is cruel and, and, and mean, and, and I'm not going to allow you to do it. So you have to give her a certificate of divorce. And he gives it to her and sends her from his house. And if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, and if her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, and if he gives it to her and sends her away from his house, or if he dies, 
then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again. <laughs> so here's what the law of Moses says. And I know it sounds a little bit convoluted, but he's saying, look, I want to build some barriers around the sanctity of marriage. I want to make divorce a little harder than what you've made it because I believe in the sanctity of marriage. That's God's heart. It always has been God's heart. So he says, look, men, you can't just put your wives away and force them into prostitution or begging. You have to give her a certificate of divorce. And if you ever divorce her, you can never bring her back and remarry her again. You have to let her go. Divorce is permanent, and you can't, you can't just get rid of her and then bring her back in. So he, he's trying to get them to stop and to think before they make these very, very irrational and emotional decisions about getting rid of a wife because there was literally no law around them that says they couldn't get rid of a wife for any reason. And so, so God, through the law, is trying to get them to stop, uphold marriage, and think before they just threw women away. And so that was the purpose of the law. Now, the Pharisees took that law, and now we're moving forward from, from uh, Moses' time up to Jesus' time. And they interpreted it uh, with, with, in a couple of ways. Number one, they did affirm that you cannot just put your wife away, that you have to give her a certificate of divorce. So they, they upheld the heart of God in that law in that way. But the second and most important issue for them was that whole uh, phrase indecent or that word indecent. And I, I want you to think about a law court and I want you to think about legal briefs because that's basically what the rabbis did is they would look at the law, that was their legal system, and they would write legal briefs or they would write interpretations of the law and then that became the law. Well, there were two camps around that word indecent. One was from a guy named Shammai he was a rabbi of that day, and he took a very conservative approach. He says, that indecent word, there's, there's got to be a sexual connotation to indecent there. And if your wife doesn't do anything uh, that you would consider sexually immoral or inappropriate, you cannot divorce your wife. That was one view, a very unpopular view, and not a, not a very well-followed view in, in uh, Jesus' day. However, the preeminent rabbi of that day was a man named Hillel. And Hillel said, here's what indecent means. Indecent is anything a woman does to displease her husband. That's what indecent is. And Hillel was very popular and very well respected. And I don't know what percentage, but the vast majority of people followed Hillel's understanding of indecent, and that become the norm for the day. So if a man is married to a woman and she burns his toast for breakfast, he sends her, he just, he just divorces her, gets rid of her. For any and every reason, anything a woman does that displeases her husband, that's called indecent and a, and a husband can divorce her. Now remember, we're still living in a time here where women are seen as co-equals with men the way that we see today and, and the way God has it in His heart. They still saw women uh, as subservient to them, and so it was all about a man. A woman couldn't divorce a man, but a man could divorce a woman for any and every reason. So that's what the Pharisees believed and taught. And so if you can imagine in, in this culture that is rampant with divorce, you think our culture is rampant with divorce in one out of every two. In, in that culture, I don't know any marriages who would not end up in a divorce. It, it was unheard of for a marriage to not end up in divorce. That was kind of the culture behind where Jesus was. And so um, what, what he ends up saying is this in verse uh, in chapter 5, verses 31 and 32 of Matthew. He said, It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Right? He's upholding what the Old Testament law and what the Pharisees interpreted the Old Testament law. You've got to give a, your wife a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So he just comes in and on the Sermon on the Mount, which is a sermon early in his ministry, 
He basically says, look, I, I, it, it's almost, it's just two verses right in the middle of this sermon about a whole lot of other things. He says, here's what the law says. You got to give a certificate of divorce. I'm telling you, as opposed to Hillel, that you can't just divorce her for any and every reason. It just can't be on a whim. It's got to be for sexual immorality. And so he's really setting a standard much stricter than what the Pharisees did. So later on in Matthew chapter 19, uh, we see the Pharisees taking what he said on the Sermon on the Mount and testing him with it and kind of pushing him with it. So for us to understand God's heart behind marriage and divorce from the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to go to chapter 19 because it's, it's much more detailed on what Jesus says about marriage and divorce. And so picking up Matthew chapter 19 verse 3, it says, Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? So think about it. What are they saying? They're picking up on Hillel's legal brief, his interpretation that most people followed, and that is a man can divorce his wife for any and every reason. That's indecent. She burned the toast. She's out of here. Now, they came to test him because they knew Jesus didn't believe that because of the Sermon on the Mount. And they wanted to get him to take a stance that would make him unpopular with the people to try to sabotage his ministry. So Jesus, instead of going back to the law, goes all the way back to creation and says this, Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And he said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, you know what? Let's don't go back to the law. Let's go back to creation. And it's one man and it's one woman for life. And the man and the woman are co-equals. And they come together in this beautiful union, this covenant of marriage. And the covenant is sealed through the act of sexual intercourse that brings them together and binds them together, and that's the will of God. And, and, and sex, we see sex sometimes as a physical or an emotional act. God says it's not just physical and emotional, it's a spiritual act that brings a man and a woman together and they become one flesh and they're brought together and their souls and their bodies and their and their emotions, their minds, their wills, everything is brought together in that sex act. That's why it's so important to only have sex in the midst of marriage and not in other contexts, because it's a sexual union uh, that, that, is, that is spiritual as well as physical. And Jesus says, God's heart is, there is no divorce. There is no divorce. In Malachi chapter 3, God just says, I hate divorce. I hate it. There's nothing about it I like. So he says, I I want one man, one woman for life. I really don't ever want divorce. So Jesus goes and says that. And he says, look, once it's put together through sexual union, no one should tear it apart. There should never be a divorce. There should never be a tearing apart. Although he's going to give the confession, what brings it together is the sexual union. What tears it apart is what? Sexual immorality. That's what tears that union apart. So they said, well, then why did Moses command that a woman give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? So they're saying, look, we go back to the law, and all the law said was, if you're going to divorce your wife, give her a certificate of divorce. That's about all the law says. There's no parameters around it the way you're putting on there, Jesus. So why would Moses say that? And I love Jesus' response. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. He says, why are divorces permitted? Because of the hardness of people's hearts. And think about it. What would cause sexual sin in a marriage? What would cause things in a marriage to happen that would tear people apart where they needed to get a divorce? It's just hardness of heart. It's selfishness. It's sin. It's unwillingness to, to uh, work on your marriage. And he says it's, ju it's just a sign of sinfulness and hard-heartedness. And then he says, Therefore I tell you that if anyone who divorces his wife, 
except for sexual immorality and marries another woman, commits adultery. So he repeats what he did on the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 where, where we are uh, in our study of the book of Matthew. Now here's what I love is I love <laughs> what his followers say. These are the most spiritual guys in Israel, right? This is Peter and John and, and, and the boys. And they said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. Divorce was so rampant in that culture that when Jesus said, you need to stay married except for sexual immorality, the disciples say, that's impossible. It's better not to marry. I can't even imagine a situation where you could stay married to a woman for 30 or 40 or 50 years. That's just crazy. <laughs> that's what they're saying here because divorce was so rampant in that culture. So that's Jesus' teaching uh, on marriage and divorce uh, out of the book of Matthew. Now, I've gone through this very, very quickly, and I, I know that you know that. But I, I want to, uh, I just want to give you some practical thoughts about marriage and divorce uh, that might help you. Okay, number one is this. As believers, we are to look for ways to stay in marriage, not get out of it. The problem Jesus had with the Pharisees is the Pharisees kept trying to get out of their marriages. They were using the law of God as, as a, a way, as a means of figuring out a way to get out of their marriages. And Jesus says, the heart of God is, I want my people to figure out ways to stay in their marriages. So I want to talk to those of you who are married or who have, uh, are single but want to get married. If you're single and want to get married, do your due diligence up front. Take your time. Get to know the person you're dating before you marry them. Because when you're marrying them, you are coming together in a covenant relationship that God never wants to end. There's no such thing as a starter spouse. When you marry, you marry for life. So take your time. Do premarital counseling. Make sure this is the person you need to be with for life. Because life is a long time. I'm not saying don't get married. I'm saying just do your due diligence. Okay. To those of you who are married, whether you're in a good marriage or in a bad marriage, look for ways to stay in your marriage. Don't look for ways to get out of it. That's the heart of God. Now, I don't want to get legalistic about when you can get in, when you can get out. I just want you to hear God's heart. Just stay in your marriage. Figure out a way. I was talking to a man this week in one of the groups, and He's, he said this, and I thought it was so amazing. He said, you know, Brad, my wife and I, uh, we got married, we were in love, and, and then we had a couple of kids, and they're teenagers, and we'd fallen out of love. And my wife came to me and she said, you know, I don't love you anymore, and you don't love me anymore, and there's no spark in our marriage, and we've grown apart, and we're not happy, and after the kids leave home, let's just get a divorce, because there's nothing here anymore. It's just dead. And so I said, okay. And we were three years away. Well, about a year later, she came to me and she said, here's what I want to do. I know our marriage is dead, but, but I've watched the pain of divorce. I don't want to get a divorce. So let's start praying right now that God will heal our marriage, that He will resurrect our dead marriage, that we'll fall back in love, that we will rekindle the flame of the love and the passion we had that made us get married in the first place. So he said, we started praying together every day that God would rekindle that passion and rekindle that love. He said, by the time our daughter had graduated from high school, we were more in love than we had ever been. And he said, we're still happily married today. Did you know that couples that pray together, the divorce rate is one in 400? One in 400. Average in America is one in two. Your marriage is a spiritual union, and if you're in a bad marriage, here's what you need to know. Don't look for a divorce. You need to sit down with your spouse, and you need, you need to get on your knees before the Lord, and you need to ask the Lord to come in your marriage and rekindle your marriage. Relight the fire. That's what God wants you to do in your marriage, not get out. And so just remember that. If you're in a good marriage, do things together. Walk together. Pray together. Bring the Lord into your marriage. 
and get counseling. Get counseling if you need it. Look for ways to stay in your marriage, not to get out. Number two, divorce is permitted for items that break the covenant. Remember, adultery is the breaking of the covenant. And just like we have a covenant with God and, and we break that covenant uh, when, we, when we leave Him and do other things, He calls that adultery. Same thing, when, when, we, when, when we break the covenant of marriage, um, it, is, it is called adultery. And, and there are times when there's so much pain and so much hurt that's under the bridge of a marriage that, that there's really nothing left but to end the marriage. And one of the examples Jesus gives here is sexual sin. And, and look, when you're married to someone and you have an affair with someone else, there's so much hurt and so much pain and so much distrust. It's hard to ever put that marriage back together again. Not impossible, but it's difficult. And Jesus says sometimes there's just so much distrust and pain and hurt that you just can't keep it together. Is that the heart of God? No, God never wants a marriage to end, but sometimes it just ends. I would add to that if there's sexual abuse going on in the home with the children. Alcohol and drug addicts, um, boy, that, that, that causes pain and suffering and mistrust to the, sometimes the marriage just can't last. Uh, if there's physical abuse going on, you, you can't stay in a marriage where there's physical abuse. And so I think the heart of God is stay married, just stay married. But I think the heart of God is also, I want to protect my people. Remember I talked about the law of Moses was set up to protect women? The laws on marriage and divorce is set up to protect us. He knows that we're hard-hearted enough that if He doesn't set a standard very strict, we're, we're going to be divorcing all the time, just causing immense pain in people's lives, including our own. But He also knows that sometimes because of our hardness of hearts, because of our own sinfulness, because of, because of uh, addiction issues and, and abuse issues and sexual issues, sometimes there's just nothing left and the marriage goes away. And I want you to know that God understands that and He's trying to protect us in marriage, but He also protects us by giving us an out when the covenant has been broken. And then finally, I would just say this, uh, all of this teaching and everything in Christianity is about your life moving forward. There is forgiveness for divorce. So if you've been divorced in the past, I don't want you to feel guilty listening to this. I want you to understand you've been saved by the grace of God. God has forgiven you for your past divorce. This is just things for you to think about moving forward in your life, moving forward as a disciple. So that's what Jesus teaches on divorce. Hear the heart of God. One man, one woman for life, no divorce. But if there is a breaking of the covenant through abuse, through sexual immorality, sometimes it has to end. And God wants to protect you in the middle of that. And He forgives you because you're His child and you're walking in His grace and His mercy. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this teaching. I know this is a hard subject. I know a lot of people don't even like to listen to this. I don't know how many people actually listen to this because it's just such a sensitive topic. But for those who are listening, those who are watching, those who are experiencing this out of the Word with me today, Lord, I just pray that you will give them a heart like yours for marriage and the institution of marriage. And if there's someone here that's in a bad marriage, that they'll get on their knees and they'll pray their way through it and not look for a way out. And if there's someone, Lord, who is in the middle of, of unbelievable pain, I pray you will come in and you will uh, heal that pain for them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.